William Wilberforce and the War Against Slavery. William Wilberforce, a great missionary to Parliament, one of the great men who worked hard for the freedom of others. But let's start off with today's slavery, the slave trade which is being ignored today. I'll start off with a tale of two islands before we get to Wilberforce. Let's go to more recent events. During President Barack Hussein Obama's 2013 visit to Africa, which at $100 million was described as the most expensive presidential tour ever, he visited Gori Island across the bay from Dakar, the capital of Senegal. There he was photographed at the fort's famous door of no return. Obama was quoted as saying, this is a testament to when we are not vigilant in defense of human rights, what can happen? Now, there was, along the west coast of Africa, the grain coast, the ivory coast, the gold coast, and the slave coast. Obama was silent on the much larger ongoing Arab slave trade that still plagues Africa to this day. Anti-slavery societies calculate that over 27 million people are victims of slavery today more than the number of slaves that William Wilberforce confronted when he began his ministry. According to UNICEF, 1.2 million children are trafficked every year. Most trafficking victims are girls between 5 to 15 years of age. One true documentary which has been turned into a drama is The Whistleblower, which speaks of an American policewoman, Catherine Bolkovac, who was sent to work with the UN in what is today understood as Bosnia, or what then was part of Yugoslavia, and uh, she rescued two girls from slavery, from sex trafficking, prostitution rings, they'd been kidnapped from Moldova, uh, f uh, from uh, what used to be the Russian Federation, and she put them in witness protection and the UN handed them right back to the pimps who tortured them to death. And she did more investigation, found the United Nations was involved in the slave trade, human trafficking, prostitution, all the rest in Bosnia. She reported this to the head of the mission. He did nothing. She went as high as the General Secretary of the United Nations. She then had death threats, and she today is living under witness protection program in Britain, as the British courts determined her life was at risk if she went back to America, the UN people going up to the General Secretary were threatening her life. So that she now has to live under an assumed name because she whistled, she blew the whistle on the United Nations involvement in human traffic today. Many of the governments which enjoy most favored nation status with the United States are involved in this modern slave trade. In fact, Mauritania which borders Senegal, has over half a million slaves amongst the country's population of just over three million. So one in six people in Mauritania are slaves. Samuel Cotton, the American author of Silent Terror, A Journey into Contemporary African Slavery, reports that Mauritanian Arabs and Berbers bring their black slaves with them to work in Dakar, even within sight of Gori Island. Yet Obama had not one word to say about this ongoing scandal of slavery today. For foreign consumption and under external pressure, Mauritania has made some half-hearted legislative attempts to outlaw slavery, but these have been described as woefully ineffective and blatantly insincere. In 2011, Four Mauritanian anti-slavery activists were sentenced to six months in jail for protesting the enslavement of a 10-year-old girl. These were not slave traffickers. These were anti-slavery activists, protesters. No punishment was ever meted out to the slave owner, and the slave girl disappeared. President Barack Hussein Obama hypocritically stated that his visit to Gori Island, a World Heritage Site, gives me even greater motivation in terms of human rights around the world. Well, he did more for human wrongs than ever for human rights during his eight years of presidency. Africans find his statements hard to take seriously. 
considering that Obama has never had one word to say about the ongoing 1,400-year Arab slave trade. Although Obama made a major point of visiting Gory Island and condemning the transatlantic slave trade, which ended over two centuries ago. He showed no interest in visiting Zanzibar, the most notorious slave island in history on the east coast of Africa. You see, there were many slave trades. <clears throat> the slave trades across the Sahara to North Africa, the slave trades from East Africa up the Atlantic Ocean, the Red Sea, even to the Gulf of Aden and the Muslim world, the slave trades even from Mozambique to, Mar to Madagascar, these don't get much press or even space in textbooks. Although Obama's second state visit was to Tanzania, he never ventured near the island of Zanzibar, through which 20,000 African slaves were processed by the Arabs every year. Now, you just look at this picture, and this gives you an example of what they call a photo op. Notice the journalist crouching down in front of him to get, give the impression that Obama's walking amongst a crowd of people, unconcerned about his personal safety, showing personal courage, shaking people's hands. But look, everyone's wearing the same clothes, the same white hats, the same outfits. They're all carrying flags, alternately Tanzanian or American. They're about only three deep, and behind them is the row of American Secret Service and Tanzanian security. These are hand-picked people for a, photo op a photographic opportunity. They've gone through security, they've gone through metal detectors, they're hand-picked. And so to give the false impression that here's a world leader unconcernedly walking amongst people, shaking hands on both sides, in fact, it was a complete fraud. These are selected people, all wearing the same outfits, all with the same kind of flag, and with security looking right over their shoulders. This was in Tanzania. Perhaps he was concerned not to embarrass his Muslim friends, who's still involved in the Arab slave trade today. Also, a visit to Stonetown on Zanzibar would have been even more embarrassing, as the former slaves, after having been liberated by the British Royal Navy, built a magnificent church over the old slave market, with the pulpit and altar where the auction block and the whipping post had stood. The Anglican Cathedral, Christ Church in Mukanzini Road, in the center of Old Town, occupies the area where the largest slave market of Zanzibar used to be situated. The construction of the cathedral was intended to celebrate the end of the Arab slave trade on Zanzibar. The altar and the pulpit were designed to be in the exact place where the main whipping post and slave auction block had been. Construction of Christchurch began 1873, the year of the death of missionary explorer Dr. David Livingston. The cathedral was completed and consecrated in 1903. Inside the church, there's a cross made from the wood of the tree under which Dr. David Livingston's heart was buried in Chitambo, northern Zambia, where he died on his knees. Near this church, there's a striking monument which has been constructed above the 15 underground cells where slaves in transit were incarcerated until their sale to the Arab masters. The monument in Stonetown consists of five stone figures in a pit, representing the captured slaves who appear to be rising out of the earth. The shackles around their necks and the chains between them testify to their plight. They look tired and sad, but they look strong. Africans asking why Barack Hussein Obama, an African-American so-called, continue to be so supportive of radical Muslim regimes who still engage in slavery today. Never had a word of criticism for the Arabs who continue to enslave Africans in Sudan, in Saudi Arabia, and throughout the Muslim Middle East. Why was he so silent about the longest and the largest slave trade in history? One that hasn't come to an end yet. Christians are still being enslaved in Sudan and taken off to Saudi Arabia to this day. The comparisons and contrast between Gori Island and Zanzibar Island are striking. While the European involvement in the transatlantic slave trade to the Americas lasted for just over three centuries, mostly the Spanish and Portuguese involvement, the Arab involvement in the slave trade has lasted 14 centuries 
and in some parts of the Muslim world is still continuing to this day. While two out of every three slaves shipped across the Atlantic were men, the proportions were reversed in the Islamic slave trade in Africa. In East Africa, the Indian Ocean, and across the Sahara, two women for every man was enslaved by the Muslims. While the mortality rate, the death rate, for slaves being transported across the Atlantic Ocean was as high as 10% could die, the percent of slaves dying in transit across the Sahara and the East African slave trade was between 80 and 90% died before reaching the slave market. 80 to 90%. While most of the slaves shipped across the Atlantic were for agricultural work, most of the slaves destined for the Muslim Middle East were for sexual exploitation as concubines in harems and in the men for military service. They had whole slave armies. While many children were born to the slaves in America and millions of their descendants are citizens in Brazil, Jamaica, Haiti, to the USA to this day, very few descendants of slaves that end up in the Middle East survived. While most slaves who went to the Americas could marry and have families, most of the male slaves who were destined to the Muslim Middle East slave markets, the bazaars, they were castrated. Most of their children born to women were killed at birth, either drowned in a bucket or had their throats slit. Either by drowning or having their throats slit, the goal was to maintain Arab numerical supremacy it was cheaper to get new slaves than waste time with bringing up these children in the Middle East. It is estimated that possibly as many as 11 million Africans were transported across the Atlantic, 95% of which went to South and Central America, mainly to the Portuguese, Spanish, and French possessions, Catholic countries. Less than 5% of all the slaves across the Atlantic went to the United States of America, actually 4.4%. However, at least 28 million Africans were enslaved by Muslims, and as at least 80% of those captured by the Muslim slave raiders were calculated to have died before reaching the slave markets, at least 80%. It's believed that the death toll from the 14 centuries of Muslim slave trades into Africa could have been well over 112 million. When added to the number of those sold in the slave markets, the total number of African victims of the Trans-Sahara and East African slave trade would be significantly higher than 140 million people. While Christian reformers spearheaded the anti-slavery abolitionist movement, with Great Britain mobilizing the Royal Navy throughout the 19th century to intercept slave ships and to set the captives free, there are no comparable opposition to slavery within the Muslim world. Can anyone ever, and I've asked this in universities with a majority of Muslims present, can you name me one Muslim reformer, one Muslim abolitionist, one Muslim leader comparable to William Wilberforce or David Livingston who campaigned to end slavery in the Muslim world? I've never heard a Muslim able to identify anyone. In scouring the history books, I can't find any comparable movement whatsoever. One book that we helped to produce is The Royal Navy versus the Slave Traders, which documents the Royal Navy's spectacular achievements in setting captives free. While Britain outlawed the slave trade in 1807, and the eight main powers of Europe, including Russia, Sweden, Germany, France, Austria, outlawed the slave trade in the Congress of Vienna in 1815, Saudi Arabia and Yemen only outlawed the slave trade in 1962 and Mauritania in 1980. However, Malcolm X, a convert to Islam, noted during his pilgrimage, his Hajj in 1968, six years after slavery was officially abandoned in Saudi Arabia, he said he saw black slaves being sold in Mecca. So, Maybe they didn't abolish it in 1962. In fact, we have a lot of evidence it's still continuing to this day. The ongoing slave trade in Mauritania is well documented, as is the slave trade in Sudan and other parts of the world. Apparently, these inconvenient facts did not merit the attention of US President Barack Hussein Obama. And rather, 
then using his visit to Africa as an opportunity to draw attention to the ongoing present slave trade today, he was satisfied with sermonizing about the need to be vigilant in the defense of human rights on what ended over 200 years ago. You know, it doesn't take any courage to kick a dead dog, which is what he's willing to do. But he's not willing to confront the live ones that are threatening people today. He remained shockingly silent on the hideous abuse of human rights taking place right now with countries with whom America has most favored nation status. Those who want to know the rest of the story, which apparently Obama and much of the mass media and Hollywood would prefer to ignore, I wrote the book Slavery, Terrorism, and Islam, The Historical Roots and the Contemporary Threat, which is in your library, which exposes these shocking facts. And of course, there's the films, Sudan Head and Holocaust, and the book Faith and Defiant Sudan. Slavery, Terrorism, and Islam is a fascinating, well-illustrated, thoroughly documented response to the relentless anti-Christian propaganda that has been generated by Muslims and by Marxist groups and by Hollywood filmmakers. As Karl Marx declared, the first battlefield is the rewriting of history. Slavery, terrorism, and Islam, historical roots and contemporary threats has already gone through three editions and five printings. With 300 pages and 200 pictures, this edition is now three times the size of the first edition which earned me a death threat fatwa from Muslim radicals. You can also access Slavery, Terrorism, Islam, and Slavery, What You've Never Been Told, as a PowerPoint through SlideShare on our frontline missionessay.org website and on Sermon Audio, which we have on our website. There's links through our social media pages. We've also produced a Muslim evangelism workshop, MP3, dealing with these issues and the Islam Rising DVDs how many of you would have seen any of the Islam Rising films? Any Islam Rising films? The Indo Library, okay. It's something that we should have shown in the evenings. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Instead of speaking out against the ongoing Islamic slave trade in Africa today, President Obama seemed to have given the highest priority to promoting his radical pro abortion and homosexual agenda. He talks about gay rights, but gays have always had the same rights as everyone else. What Obama is really advancing is privileges for perverts. Notice Newsweek putting a gay rainbow halo over him, calling him America's first gay president. Pro-family advocates complained of the arrogant, often bullying manner and insensitivity of the U.S. State Department against pro-life, pro-family administrations in Africa. Marriage can only be between one man and one woman. I mean, that's obvious. It's biblical. It's been so for centuries. And yet now that can be considered hate speech. Kenyan President Uhuru Kenyatta and Deputy President William Rotter slammed Obama's remarks declaring this country, the country of Kenya, is a God-fearing nation. Homosexuality is illegal in Kenya as it is in most of Africa. An Anglican bishop in Kenya declared, people who have ruined their own country should not presume to come here and lecture us on the way forward. In April 2013, the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, embarked on one of the most shocking abuses of U.S. taxpayers' money. The U.S. government announced it would be spending $11 million to train homosexual activists in other countries, mostly in Africa. The Washington Blade... <clears throat> D.C.'s gay newspaper praised the Obama administration for creating an army of international lobbyists for same-sex marriages, anti-discrimination laws, and homosexual rights, so-called, around the world. And according to USAID, the first phase is to focus on developing countries, it's another word for Africa, that oppose homosexuality. Africa's got most of the laws in the world against homosexuality, and so we've been the main target. 54 of the 55 countries in Africa oppose homosexuality. South Africa is the only country in Africa to have privileges for perverts written into the Constitution. Here you can see <clears throat> the countries around the world that have legalized so-called gay marriage. Sadly, disgracefully, South Africa is the only country in Africa to have given an 
to this international gay GB pink inquisition bullying. It's nothing other than privileges for perverts, promoting perversity. Many in Africa described Obama's presidency as a bitter disappointment. His Nobel Peace Prize of 2009 as the most cynical Orwellian meaningless gesture ever. In fact, at the end of his presidency, there were many in Norway pressurizing, surely we should ask for that <clears throat> Nobel Peace Prize to be taken away from Bomb because he had done nothing to deserve it and he had bombed eight countries. He had done more assassinations than any other president in American history, more collateral damage with the drone assassinations, thousands and thousands of people killed by drone assassinations or under the orders of Obama during his eight years, no one had ever done more assassinations by executive order than him, killing thousands of Africans and thousands more Asians with his drone assassinations, where these rockets come from the sky from a drone flying overhead, and always there's collateral damage. Civilians being killed, not just the terrorists they claim to have been targeting. How do you get a peace prize for bombing eight countries? and killing thousands of people. Steve Friedman, the director of Rhodes and Johannesburg University, has declared, I don't think it's unkind to say that Obama has done absolutely nothing for this continent of Africa. In some respects, George W. Bush did more for Africa than Barack Obama. I cannot remember an American administration that has shown less interest in this continent than this one. One of the first official acts of George W. Bush, who our media hates, after his elected president was to defund Planned Parenthood's abortions overseas. So actually, George W. Bush saved millions of lives in Africa just by that one act of defunding abortions from Planned Parenthood. One of Barack Hussein Obama's very first acts as president was to refund Planned Parenthood's abortions in Africa. So millions of babies were killed in Africa with American taxpayers' money because of Obama's instructions in his first week as president. So because of Barack Hussein Obama's pro-abortion policies, hundreds of thousands of black babies were killed in Africa through abortion with US taxpayers' money. Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord and so bring wrath upon yourself from the Lord? 2 Chronicles 19.2 should be written across a huge amount of the politicians of this world. Should you help the wicked? Should you love those who hate the Lord? If you do, the wrath of God is upon you. So, with that contemporary context, let's look back over 200 years on William Wilberforce and the war against slavery. The slave trade in the early 19th century presented a monumental ethical challenge and an apparently insurmountable obstacle to missionary outreaches in Africa. How could you go to any villages in Africa and share the gospel while people are terrified of being enslaved and wanting to flee from slave raiders and trying to hide from them. The abolition of the slave trade helped prepare the way for the 19th century to become the greatest century of missionary advance. As we battle great social evils today, such as abortion, pornography, perversion, persecution, and as we work for reformation, the overwhelming opposition and pressure can drive one to exhaustion and a temptation to want to give up the fight. William Wilberforce, the reformer who led the campaign to abolish the slave trade and to set those in bondage free, was persistently slandered in the media. He was threatened. He is physically assaulted. He is even the target of attempted murder. Yet he persevered. And after a lifetime crusade, his steadfastness was rewarded with the liberation of all slaves in the British Empire. At this critical stage in history, Christians need to learn from one of the greatest Christian statesmen and how in the face of constant derision and opposition, he succeeded in abolishing the slave trade in his generation. All nations and tribes engaged in slavery, particularly Muslim nations. However, it was the Emperor Charles V of the Holy Roman Empire before whom Professor Martin Luther made his historic My Conscience is Captive, the Word of God, Here I Stand, I Can Do No Other Speech. It was that Charles V who first authorized Europe's disgraceful involvement in the slave trade in 1519. Because of Pope Alexander VI's mark of 
demarcation, his bull of 1493, which separated the world down the line there into Brazil can be to the east and Spain to the left or to the west of that line, which is why Brazil was in the Portuguese era and Mozambique and Angola and Cape Verde Islands was in the Portuguese era and the rest to the west of that line of demarcation was given to Spain. Spain issued asientos, a monopoly to other nations to supply slaves for the South American colonies. Didn't want it to be Portugal because Portugal was the competition, the immediate neighbor in the opposition, competition. And first Portugal had this lucrative franchise, but then they quickly handed over to the Dutch, then the French, and finally by the Treaty of Utrecht, 1713, the asientos was transferred from France to Britain. And initially the contract was for 4,800 slaves a year. During the next century, Britain transported up to 2 million slaves to the New World. 2 million slaves in 100 years. Britain's involvement in slavery was first authorized in 1631 by King Charles I, the same Charles I who was later executed by order of Parliament, beheaded for his treason for violating the Magna Carta, the Great Charter, and his coronation oath. His son Charles II reintroduced it by royal charter in 1672. The Protestant Parliament of Oliver Cromwell, of course, abolished Britain's involvement in the slave trade. So you can see it's the enemies of the Reformation who got Europe involved in the slave trade. Charles V, Charles V, Charles I, Charles II. Easy to remember, three Charles. The trade, as it became known. You know, noticed in the abortion films, they refer to abortion as the procedure. I've always got a nice euphemism to avoid talking about what they want to talk about. The American government doesn't kill and assassinate people, they terminate them. And they don't kill civilians, it's collateral damage. It's not mass murder, it's strategic bombing campaigns, saturation bombing and so on. So there's always a nice term. So instead of speaking about slavery, they speak about the trade. Instead of murdering babies or abortion, it's the procedure. So the trade involved a triangular voyage. Slave ships went from Bristol or Liverpool to Africa with cloth beads, muskets, iron bars, and brandy to trade for slaves. This merchandise was the merchandise, which is what they called the slaves from Africa, were then exchanged for slaves. The African chiefs sold their own people or even engaged in wars and slave raids against neighboring tribes to capture victims for the trade. Often professional Arab slave traders provided the victims. The Middle Passage transport the slaves from Africa to the West Indies, mostly to Cuba and Jamaica, where the slaves were sold and the ships were loaded with spices, rum, molasses, and sugar. The third leg of the journey was from the Americas back to Europe, and they brought the sugar, the spices, and the rum. Now, 160 British ships are ultimately involved in this slaving. So there's the slave trade. You've got the manufactured goods coming to Africa, slaves going to Central America, and then sugar, molasses, rum going back to Europe. And so it's the middle passage, number two, that people were kept in the dark about. You can see the main ports involved in this wicked, abominable trade, and the main areas where the slaves came from. But, of course, there's another part of slavery which most textbooks don't tell you about, and that is the slave trade across the Sahara Desert and across East Africa and up the Indian Ocean and into the Red Sea and into the Gulf of Aden and even up to Iran. The average Englishman on the street was kept in the dark as to what actually happened on the Middle Passage until, in 1785, Thomas Clarkson's landmark study Slavery and the Commerce in the Human Species was first published in Latin it, at Cambridge and then translated to English and then it was widely distributed. And people started to understand what was involved in the Middle Passage. And you could see there would be these sort of adverts in Cuba or in Haiti or in Jamaica where they were advertising these kinds of classifieds. 
In 1787, William Wilberforce wore out the pages of his copy of Clarkson's book on slavery. According to Clarkson's research, 10% of the slaves would normally die during the Middle Passage. Strong men could fetch as much as 40 pounds, while women and children were sold in cheap batches with the sick and the weak men. The fit were often branded with silver branding irons to minimize infection. Slaving was one of the largest, most profitable sectors of the British economy. In England, 18,000 people were employed simply making goods to trade for slaves in West Africa, and this trade constituted 4.4% of British exports. On Sunday, the 28th of October, 1787, William Wilberforce wrote in his diary, God Almighty has set before me two great objects, the suppression of the slave trade and the reformation of society. <coughs> William Wilberforce was born in 1759 into a wealthy family, educated at Cambridge University. He was elected to Parliament in 1780 at the age of just 21. He served in the House of Commons for the next 45 years. William was short, frail, frequently sick, afflicted with poor eyesight, not a healthy person. However, he more than made up for his weak body with a vigorous mind and boundless energy. He was a particularly gifted speaker and generous to friends and strangers alike. As a child, he'd been strongly influenced by the dedicated faith of an uncle and an aunt. And William's father died when he was just nine years old. So he was sent to live with William and Hannah Wilberforce, who were childless. William's uncle and aunt were friends of George Whitfield, the great evangelist. And William later described how he had been deeply impressed by Whitfield's preaching and by visits to his uncle's home. He also met with John Newton, the former slave ship captain who had been converted and later wrote Amazing Grace, which we sang at the beginning of the session. When William's mother realized that his son was becoming too religious, she came and took him back and placed him in a boarding school and encouraged a more worldly lifestyle. Can you imagine a mother wanting a child to be more worldly and less religious? But that's what uh, William had to face. As a member of Parliament, William Wilberforce opposed the British war against American colonists, declaring that the cabinet ministers were acting like lunatics. And he denounced their cruel, bloody, and impractical policies. And Wilberforce made his name with his quick wit and devastating sarcasm. And you can imagine, unpopular to be supporting the enemies of the country during a time of war. In 1783, he traveled to France and he met King Louis XVI, Mary Antoinette, Lafayette, Benjamin Franklin, great Americans. His good friend, William Pitt, was then elected prime minister and at age 24, the youngest prime minister in the history of Britain. Imagine a prime minister just 24 years old. Wilberforce then stood for Yorkshire, the largest county in England, and won by landslide. And because he represents such an important county, he had a lot of influence. In fact, Wilberforce could have easily been the next Prime Minister of England, except that he chose an unpopular cause. It was at this point when he had won an unassailable position in both politics and society that Wilberforce was confronted with the claims of the Gospel of Christ through a book, The Rise and Progress of Religion in the Soul, written by Philip Dodderidge. Wilberforce's mind was convinced of the truth of the gospel, but he recognized that intellectual assent was not enough. Can't just be in your mind. It's got to be not just in the head, but in the heart and the hands too. A sharp conflict raged with him. I am no Christian, he was forced to admit. He was overcome with anguish. The deep guilt and dark ingratitude of my past life forced itself upon me in the strongest colors. And I condemned myself for having wasted precious time and opportunities and talents. He was appalled by the shapeless idleness and by his sense of great sinfulness in having so long neglected the unspeakable mercies of my God and Savior. Through all his heart searching and Bible study and prayer, he was transformed. Now, since nearly all politicians drank, gambled, engaged in corrupt practices, doesn't sound much different from today, does it? William assumed that he had now have to give up his chosen political career. In turmoil, he went to see his boyhood hero, Reverend John Newton. Should he give up politics and become a preacher? 
Or should he seclude himself from society to live a life of quiet meditation and prayer, almost like a monastery? No, in response, Newton admonished him that to leave his post in Parliament would be desertion. Desertion from the duty to which God had called him. It is hoped and believed that the Lord has raised you up for the good of his church and for the good of this nation. Indeed, prophetic words. If he stayed in politics, William Wilberforce would find opportunities to advance God's kingdom that other men could only dream of. Wilberforce informed the Prime Minister that he could no longer vote the party line if it conflicted with his Christian conscience and principles. The change in William's behaviour and his politics was dramatic. He resigned from five clubs in one day. He stopped going to plays and theatres which had become particularly decadent at that time. He gave up gambling and with a new intellectual rigour, he set to redeem his idle years. He became less temperamental more stable, and more cheerful. He saw clearly that if a man becomes a Christian, it should influence everything he thinks and everything he does. He began to search the scriptures for the principles upon which his politics should be based. As he explained to one constituent, one of the voters, we are to give an account of our political conduct at the judgment seat of Christ. We will be called to account before God for what we have voted what we've supported, what we've done. At his conversion, there were only two evangelical members of parliament. Two. But by the time of his death, there were over 100 evangelical, born-again members of the House of Commons and the House of Lords. That's a phenomenal change to think. In his lifetime, they went from two to 100 Bible-believing Christians in parliament. One of William Wilberforce's first actions as a Christian was to persuade the king, George III, to issue a proclamation for spiritual reformation throughout the land. On the 1st of June, 1787, the king gazetted a proclamation for the encouragement of piety and virtue and for the prevention of vice, profaneness, and immorality. Okay, piety, devotion. Virtue, good conduct, high standards, ethics. Prevention of vice, by vice they're talking about drunkenness, prostitution, homosexuality, perversion, immoral prints, pornography effectively. Profaneness, meaning taking the name of God in vain, blasphemy. Immorality, well, that covers all failures in morals. It declared the proclamation issued by the king, whereas we cannot but observe with inexpressible concern the rapid progress of impiety and licentiousness, that means breaking of God's laws, that deluge of profaneness or blasphemy, immorality and every kind of vice, vice, drunkenness, prostitution, pornography, these things, do hereby declare our royal purpose and resolution to discountenance, that means discourage, and punish all manner of vice, profaneness, and immorality. Church attendance was urged, Sheriffs and justices were to be very vigilant and strict, vigilant, alert, in prosecuting those guilty of excessive drinking, blasphemy, profane swearing and cursing, lewdness or other immoral and dissolute practices. They were ordered to close down brothels, prostitution dens, destroy all loose and licentious prints, pornography, books and publications dispersing poison in the minds of the young and to punish the publishers and vendors thereof. In other words, people who produce pornography and people who sell it are to be punished. The Secretary of State was instructed to send six copies of the proclamation to the High Sheriff of every county, with the King's command that this be read publicly and acted upon. At the time, very few realized that it's a member for Yorkshire, William Wilberforce, who was the author of this proclamation. Do you think he had the king's ear to such an extent? He could have easily been the next prime minister. Wilberforce then established a proclamation society to ensure that the proclamation became a force rather than a farce. Local chapters of reformation societies were to work to bring about reformation at every level of society. The time was ripe. Many thousands whose lives had been transformed by the preaching of Whitfield and Wesley 
were involved in a campaign to clean up and reshape the nation of England. Magistrates throughout the nation eagerly responded to the proclamation. The seriousness of the crime wave provoked a groundswell of popular support for Wilberforce's campaign. As Wilberforce wrote, Surely, the principles as well as the practice of Christianity are simple and they lead to action. Wilberforce also wrote a book which had an enormous impact on upper classes of Britain. And you remember from yesterday, it's the book that dramatically changed the life of David Livingston. The title was A Practical View of the Prevailing Religious System of Professed Christians in the High and Middle Classes of this Country contrasted with real Christianity. We often refer to it as real Christianity or practical Christianity uh, to abbreviate this long title. In six months, this book went through five editions and sold 7,500 copies, considering the kind of print technology that they had then, one page at a time, very slow moving. That's a phenomenal bestseller. By 1826, 15 editions had been printed in England and 25 editions in America, it was also translated into French, Italian, Spanish, Dutch, and German. Practical Christianity, or real Christianity. David Livingston, the missionary who pioneered Christianity throughout the hinterland of Africa, who successfully campaigned to eradicate the Islamic slave trade, testified that real Christianity was one of the most important and formative books he ever read, and it dominated his whole life. In Parliament, William Wilberforce generally voted against the expenditure of any money, although it was the government which needed to free the slaves because it was the government who was protecting the slave traders. So he wanted less government, more responsibility, but the slave trade is the government's responsibility because their navy and their taxes were protecting the traders who were benefiting from this evil trade. Wilberforce knew the government could not do everything. In fact... Government should not exceed its jurisdiction. The Bible clearly limits the state's authority to being ministers of defense, ministers of law, ministers of law and order, ministers of justice. Romans 13, 1 Peter 2 makes clear what the role of government is. To protect the law abiding, to punish the lawbreakers, to defend the country from invasion, to protect citizens from criminals and lawbreakers. That's government's job. It's not meant to do the work of the church it's not meant to run the hospitals, it's not meant to run the economy, it's not meant to interfere in education, those things. Government is meant to protect citizens from crime and invasion. That's its job. Law and order, justice and defense. That's government's jo job. And therefore, stopping the slave trade is part of its primary duty. For this reason, Wilberforce did not support the expansion of government powers. He never supported increased taxation. Because the state is the minister of justice, the church is a minister of grace. So William Wilberforce did much to help the poor needy personally through voluntary societies. In some years, he gave more to charity than his entire income. And so not surprisingly, he ended his life bankrupt without even a home, having to live in a room in one of his children's homes because he had given everything away. He was just too generous. In 1802, the Proclamation Society was replaced by the Society for the Suppression of Vice. Amongst the many inspired to Reformation principles by his society was Lord Shaftesbury, who began his campaign to outlaw child labor in the factories the year well before it died, and Princess Victoria, who later became Britain's longest queen, Queen Victoria, after whom Victoria Falls, Lake Victoria, Fort Victoria, and so much more has been named. In 1803, William Wilberforce also helped to launch the British and Foreign Bible Society, from which the first interdenominational society which united Anglicans and dissenters, it's the first society where Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, Anglicans and others could work together for a common aim. And this is the father of all Bible societies in the world. He also supported Hannah Moore's pioneering of the first Sunday schools. He helped launch the Church Missionary Society, a great Anglican missionary society. He started the Society for the Bettering of the Condition of the Poor and a lot more. He paid for missionaries to go to Tahiti. He regularly supported William Wilberforce's, William Wilberforce regularly supported William Carey's Baptist mission in India. One person described William Wilberforce, factories did not spring up more rapidly in Leeds and Manchester than schemes of benevolence beneath his roof. 
Wilberforce's home became a kind of national center for benevolence or charity and moral reform. At one time, he was president, vice president, or member of the committee for 69 societies. And he managed all this while being married with four sons and two daughters, and also remarkable, is unlike most men of his day, he spent quality time playing and praying with his children. As William Wilberforce declared, the spiritual interests of my children is my first priority. Everyone attended family prayers, which were held while kneeling twice a day. Three, these times of devotion were described as short and cheerful. Wilberforce urged his fellow members of Parliament to curtail the activities on Sunday, the Lord's Day, if not to honour the Lord's Day, at least for the sake of their servants who should be allowed to attend church and be off. William Wilberforce set the example. He attended both services every Sunday at his church, morning and evening. He would only travel or discuss politics and Lord's Day in the gravest emergency, such as war. However, it was his campaign to abolish slavery that dominated most of William Wilberforce's life and demanded most of his time and energy. Fighting slavery. Captain Sir Charles Middleton, while in the Navy, had boarded a French ship in West Indies, and he was horrified by it. He wrote to William Wilberforce requesting him to raise the matter in Parliament, and Wilberforce responded that while he felt unequal to the task, he could not possibly decline. In discussing this with his friend, the Prime Minister, William Pitt, Pitt declared, Wilberforce, England needs a crusader to wake her up. This slave trade is horrible business. It will be a long, hard fight, but someone must take the lead. William, you are that man. John Newton also encouraged William Wilberforce to launch a crusade against slavery. The example of Jesus Christ inspired him. Our Lord quoted this passage at the beginning of his ministry. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release for the prisoners. Realizing that he is going to war against an extremely profitable business with deeply entrenched business interests and with a lot of political support, Wilberforce prepared his campaign carefully. As Jesus said, when you go to war, you've got to count the cost and see that you can win. He gathered around himself a group of researchers and assistants dedicated to eradicating slavery. Granville Sharp was one of them. He was the lawyer who in 1772 had initiated a lawsuit which had successfully established the principle based on the common law of England, including the dooms of King Alfred and the Magna Carta, Great Charter, that as soon as any slave set foot in Britain, he automatically became free. There can be no slave in the British Isles. Thomas Clarkson, the author of Slavery and the Commerce and Human Species, and Zachary Macaulay, who himself had once been a slave plantation owner before his conversion to Christ. These and others were tireless, innovative members of William Wilberforce's team. They strengthened the campaign. A debilitating illness delayed William, but finally on the 12th of May, 1789, he introduced a bill for the abolition of the slave trade. I mean not to accuse anyone, he began, but to take the shame upon myself in common with the whole Parliament of Britain for having suffered this horrid trade to be carried out under their authority. We are all guilty. We ought all to plead guilty and not to exculpate or excuse ourselves by throwing the blame on others. He spoke for three and a half hours, moving 12 resolutions against the trade, Reports described it as one of the most gripping and moving speeches ever delivered in the history of the British Parliament. Pitt declared that Wilberforce had all, he had the greatest natural eloquence of all the men I ever knew. Most of the House of Commons were convinced of the righteousness of Wilberforce's arguments. But they were fearful that abolition would result in an economic disaster. So the House accepted a delaying tactic proposed by the planters that the slavers be given leave to produce evidence in reply. The matter was deferred until the next session. Tragically, the French Revolution 
erupted 14th of July, 1789, before the next session. You can see the hand of Satan here, delaying a movement that was destined to win at that time. The tide of public opinion hardened against abolition in reaction to the anarchy and the mass murder going on across the channel. When the evidence on behalf of the slave trade was concluded in April 1790, the slavers tried to get a snap decision before evidence against slavery could be heard. Wilberforce needed to promptly mobilize his forces to win the right to continue, but then a general election in June 1790 interrupted the process. The deteriorating situation in France, that people were being beheaded, and a bloody revolt by slaves in Saint-Dominique was exploited by the planters who attributed these revolutions to William Wilberforce's abolition campaign. It was completely unfair. It was unrelated. On the 18th of April, 1791, the House debated Wilberforce's bill until 3.30 a.m. in the morning. The vote ended in defeat for the abolitionist 163 to just 88. In the light of this reversal, it was a defeat. Wilberforce began a regular strategy meeting for his co-workers and his allies in the library at Clapham. The Clapham community recognized that this campaign could well require a lifetime to win. It was not going to be an easy battle, just like fighting abortion today. These meetings were often bathed in prayer, and out of the strategy sessions came the idea of outflanking the corrupt puppets of the West Indian interest in Parliament by creating a groundswell of popular support for the abolition of slavery. Many thousands, ultimately millions of pamphlets, were printed and distributed, including these. Clarkson produced a shocking drawing of how slaves were packed like sardines into slave ships for the Middle Passage. This print, Am I Not a Man and a Brother, was mass-produced and widely circulated. Public meetings and rallies were organized countrywide. A boycott of sugar, because sugar was produced by slave labor at that time, was supported by over 300,000 people, including William Carey, who would not have sugar because it was produced with slave labor. Similarly, many people today refuse to buy any products made in China because China uses slave labor. And so all the toys in McDonald's, no, everything in McDonald's really of, of the toys are made by slave labor in China. Almost all the toys of Disney World are made in China. And so many people today try to avoid things made in China because China uses slave labor, many of which are Christian brothers and sisters, locked up in concentration camps and slave camps to particularly work without pay in slave factories to produce things cheaper than any local people can produce. And so China today is the biggest slave force probably in the world, just like Jamaica, Cuba, Haiti was used for production of sugar at that time. 517 petitions for abolition, that means abolishing of slavery, was delivered to Parliament. Only four petitions against. In 1792, with slave revolts in Haiti and threatened revolts in British Jamaica, where slaves outnumbered the colonists 16 to 1, war with France was looming. There was public reticence and panic even, which swayed the debate. The best William Wilberforce could achieve was a resolution to gradually abolish the slave trade by 1796. This was passed by 230 to 85 in the House of Commons, but the bill became bogged down and sank beneath the surface in the House of Lords, the upper house, like the Senate. The fact that King George III had gone insane at this time that Britain had just lost their war with the American colonies did not help matters either. It was a real reaction now. Wilberforce pledged to introduce a new bill to abolish the slave trade every year until it did succeed. And he did every year. The last letter ever written by John Wesley was a fairly pessimistic message to Wilberforce. I see not how you can go through with your glorious enterprise in opposing that execrable villainy which is the scandal of religion the scandal of England and of human nature. Unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you will be worn out by the opposition of men and devils. Here's an actual copy of his letter. Indeed, Wilberforce was becoming one of the most hated men in England. 
On different occasions, his life was physically threatened by West Indian sea captains who saw their occupation undermined. National hero Admiral Lord Nelson wrote from his flagship victory to condemn the damnable doctrine of Wilberforce and his hypocritical allies. Now, Lord Nelson is someone normally respected, but it just showed the spirit of the time. Admiral Lord Rodney declared he had never known any slave to be mistreated in the West Indies. Lord Heathfield, the defender of Gibraltar, another national hero, commented that a slave on his way to the West Indies had twice as much cubic air space as a British soldier in a regulation tent. As though that had anything to do with it. Admiral Lord St. Vincent declared the whole of society will go to pieces if Wilberforce's abolition bill goes through. The Duke of Clarence asserted in the House of Lords that the promoters of the abolition were either frauds or hypocrites. Every disturbance or revolt in the West Indies was blamed on William Wilberforce. Lord Malmesbury in 1791 insisted on Wilberforce being tried for murder and executed because some murders were committed by slaves. Because he spoke up for slaves, therefore he is guilty of any crimes committed by them. Langford Hodge accused Wilberforce of having created a volcano. Wilberforce was the target of scurrilous smear campaigns. While he was still a bachelor, he was accused of being a wife beater and his wife was black, they said while he was a bachelor. Others accused of being a Republican, now remember, Britain's a monarchy, so being a Republican is obviously to be a traitor, and of being a revolutionary. All abolitionists are Jacobins. Jacobins are French revolutionaries, declared Lord Abingdon. King George III declared that Wilberforce and his allies were hypocrites and not to be trusted. Now, considering he once was the king's favorite, this has got to be quite devastating reversal. Other printed attacks on Wilberforce included totally ignorant of the subject of slavery, the most consummate hypocrite, favoring fat, lazy Negro slaves who were laughing from morning till night over his own countrymen. Wyndham called him a wicked little fanatical imp. So how did Wilberforce manage to persevere in the face of such sustained hatred and character assassination, lies and libel? Well, he established and sustained a lifetime of daily discipline. He knew the value of the first few days of the, the first few hours of the day for Bible study, for prayer, for mental preparation for the day. He sought to discipline his tongue, his tastes, and his thoughts. Tongue, tastes, and thoughts. He surrendered his reputation to God early on and commented after a slanderous article published in the Courier that these attacks are like the barking of dogs as he passed through a village. The dogs may bark, but the caravan must go on. He preferred criticisms to flattery. And he said, God is freedom from the fear of men's opinions. He did all that he could, and then he trusted into God's hands what he could not. His faith was resilient because it was not in himself. It wasn't God. God is sovereign. God guides. God overrules in our lives down to the smallest detail, that God could even put his thoughts in our minds. William Wilberforce once asked the pastor if he believed in God's specific guidance. Yes, said the clergyman, on great occasions. As unphilosophical as unscriptural responded William Wilberforce. Must not the smallest links be as necessary for maintaining the continuity as the greatest? There is no great or small with God. A chain is only as strong as the weakest link. He was adamant that God intervened and was sovereign both national and personal matters. Wilberforce was so crystal clear about his principles, so free of worry about himself, that he was free to think about others, even people he hadn't met far away. Another reason for William Wilberforce's astonishing resilience and persistence in his campaigns is that he never worked alone. He was supported by a community of dedicated, hard-working activists. In order to accommodate freed slaves, the Clapham community of William Wilberforce found a settlement in Sierra Leone in 1787 with a capital entitled Freetown. They poured vast investments into this venture through their Sierra Leone company as a form of restitution for England's shameful role in the slave trade. Initially, this 
Venture was plagued with disasters and a series of revolts, as well as devastating raid by French naval squadron, which burned down just about everything in 1794. But by the time Zachary Macaulay, the first governor, finally returned to England in 1799, the capital Freetown was a thriving community of 1,200 people with 300 houses and three wharves to facilitate foreign trade. Sierra Leone was an important project for the abolitionists because it demonstrated that relations between Europe and West Africa could be healthy and involve legitimate commerce. It also showed that freed slaves could hold down responsible positions and that Africa had more products for trade than human flesh. The day that the slave trade was abolished in 1807, the company handed Sierra Leone over to the Crown of England. While fighting against slavery abroad, Wilberforce was also intensely involved in reform at home. As early as 1786, he began introducing bills to reform the criminal law. For example, he opposed that flogging or whipping in the army be abolished. It was very common for the army to whip people who disagreed with them or over discipline issues. And he also sought to improve prison conditions. He investigated working conditions and dangers in the coal mines. And he was the first to campaign against the abuses of child labor in the cotton mills. He also pioneered popular education. And he campaigned against the game laws, poaching of wildlife. However, it was Britain's global responsibilities that preoccupied most of Wilberforce's energies. He organized intervention on the victims of the Napoleonic Wars, the Greeks who were then fighting for their freedom from the Ottoman Turkish Islamic Empire, the North American Indians, the Haitians, and the Hottentots in the Cape Colony. One of the most important campaigns was to work for a new sense of Christian responsibility in Britain's policies for India. The prevailing view was that Britain's relations with India were purely commercial, as they would say. The British East India Handbook of 1810 devoted 48 pages to the subject of mistresses, the upkeep cosmetics and ornaments. The company felt no responsibility for the education or ethics of the people they were ruling. By an act of British Parliament, missionaries were forbidden to operate in India. The British missionary pioneer William Carey had been forced to seek sanctuary in Danish enclave in Sarampal in order to carry out his illegal missionary activity in British-controlled India. From 1793, Wilberforce began proposing resolutions to Parliament to authorize chaplains, missionaries, and school teachers to serve in India. He sought to bring to Parliament's attention Kerry's research exposing the prevalent Hindu practice of widow burning, that when a widow died, when a man died, a widow had to die as well on his funeral pyre, on the fire. Infanticide, the killing or sacrificing of infants, human sacrifices and the horrors of the caste system. Yet the British government refused to intervene because these practices had religious sanction in Hinduism. They did not want to upset the commercial dealings with Hindu India. Wilberforce declared that the exclusion of Christ's ambassadors from British India was, next to the slave trade, the foulest blot on the moral character of our country. Describing the terrible poverty, degradation, disdain for relieving human suffering and human rights abuse in India, he exclaimed, the remedy, sir, is Christianity. Christianity assumes her true character when she takes under her protection those poor degraded beings on whom philosophy looks down with disdain, or perhaps with contemptuous condescension. Christianity delights to instruct the ignorant, to succor the needy, to comfort the sorrowful, to visit the forsaken. When challenged at his forcing his views on the Indians, he responded, compulsion and Christianity? Why, the very terms are variants. The ideas are incompatible. Christianity is the law of liberty. He was not asking Parliament to organize evangelism, but merely to permit evangelism. Since the East India Company had been given a monopoly from Parliament, it was up to Parliament to ensure that they practiced religious freedom in India. In 1806, Wilberforce wrote, next to the slave trade, 
I've long thought I'm making no effort to introduce the blessings of religion and moral improvement amongst our subjects in the East, the greatest of our national crimes. We have too many who seem to think our dominion is safer under Brahma and Vishnu than under the Almighty. Wilberforce fought for a new charter that would permit the activity of all missionaries, whether preachers, ordained or lay preachers, of the established church or of dissenters like Baptist and Methodists. Wilberforce's campaign was supported by 1,837 petitions with over half a million signatures on this issue alone. Ultimately, William Wilberforce succeeded. In 1813, Parliament passed a new charter for the East India Company guaranteeing religious liberty for the propagation of the Christian faith. This was a watershed moment in Britain's relationships with India, marking the change from looting to paternalism. As a result of the evangelical influence in British society and parliament, Britain thereafter approached the native populations and races of Africa and Asia with a completely different goal from any other country. For administrative justice, kindness and moderation, not merely for increasing the security of the subjects and the prosperity of the country, but of advancing social happiness and ameliorating the moral state of men and of extending a superior light. This is revolutionary. It's not the way the French, Portuguese or other Catholic countries operate. This is uniquely Protestant Reformation principles guiding now British overseas activities. And so in 1828, Lord Benwick, as Governor General of India, outlawed Thagi, assassination for religious purposes. And Suti, the burning alive of widows on their husband's funeral pyres. And female infanticide. In 1807, 20 years after he began his crusade, and in the middle of Britain's war with France, Wilberforce and his team's labours were rewarded with victory. Finally, at four o'clock in the morning, on the 4th of February, the abolition bill was house, passed in the House of Lords. And on 22nd of February, 1807, it passed the second reading in the House of Commons. A new generation of statesmen, inspired by Wilberforce's tenacious example, rose up to speak in favor of the abolition bill. The motion to abolish the slave trade was carried by an overwhelming 288 votes to just 16 against. The parliamentarians leapt to their feet with great cheers and gave William Wilberforce the greatest ovation ever heard in British parliamentary history. William Belt bent forward in a seat, his head in his hands, tears of gratitude streaming down his face that this long crusade of 20 years had been crowned with success. By Almighty God. The first clause declared, all manner of dealing in and trading in the purchase of slaves or their transport from Africa to the West Indies or any other territory is utterly abolished, prohibited, and declared to be unlawful. The second clause declared that any British ship involved in the slave trade shall be confiscated and forfeit to the Crown. For the next 26 years, Wilberforce worked for the total emancipation or freedom of all slaves. So this abolished the slave trade but they still need to set free those who were slaves. In 1809, the British government issued an order in council authorizing British ships of the Royal Navy to search suspected slave ships, even foreign vessels on the high seas. In 1810, Parliament made slave trading a felony punishable by 14 years hard labor. Wilberforce also solicited the foreign powers, such as Tsar Alexander of Russia, to help eradicate slavery. Slavery, terrorism, and Islam, the historical roots and contemporary threat documents all of this. He mobilized 800 petitions with almost a million signatures for abolition and he compelled the British representative at the Congress of Vienna in 1814 to insist on abolition being part of the international treaty that ended the 25 years of French revolutionary and Napoleonic wars. The obstructionism of some countries was swept aside when Napoleon returned from Elba and proclaimed the abolition of the slave trade, no doubt, as a bid to win British favor. 
In that, Napoleon failed. But when Louis XVIII was restored by British arms after Waterloo to be King of France, he had no choice but to confirm Napoleon's gesture and bow to British pressure. And so, a declaration by the eight powers of Europe, Russia, Austria, Sweden, Germany, Denmark, France, Britain, was the next to the final treaty signed on 9th of June 1815, abolishing the slave trade. However, only the British Royal Navy seriously attempted to enforce this decision. Squadrons of British warships patrolled the west coast of Africa to intercept slave ships and set captives free. Now William Wilberforce fought for the registration of all slaves in British overseas territories with the goal of the eventual emancipation. Individual cases of abuse, like whipping of slaves, or these were widely published, to mobilize public opinion against slavery. Slave owners shown to have mistreat their slaves were prosecuted. Wilberforce founded the Anti-Slavery Society in 1823. He wrote a book, Appeal to the Religion, Justice, and Humanity of the Inhabitants of the British Empire on behalf of the Negro slaves in the West Indies. In response, the slave owners mounted the most unprecedented campaign to wear him down. But Wilberforce was of tougher metal, and he refused to be diverted from his path. In 1824, Britain passed a bill ranking slave trading with piracy and punishable by death. In spite of all the opposition, the groundswell of anti-slavery opinion was mobilizing, and finally in 1833, while Wilberforce lay dying, a runner was sent to his house to inform him his lifetime campaign was now fully successful. By an act of parliament, all 700,000 slaves in British overseas territories, most in Jamaica, were set free. Thank God that I have lived to witness the day in which England is willing to give £20 million sterling for the abolition of slavery. He died within three days rejoicing. The fulfillment of his labours was the end of his life. The body of William Wilberforce was buried in Westminster Abbey, where the memorial states, he was among the foremost of those who fixed the character of their times. To warm benevolence, he added the abiding eloquence of a Christian life. A leader in every work of charity, his name will ever be specially identified with those exertions which, by the blessing of God, removed from England, the guilt of the African slave trade and prepared the way for the abolition of slavery in every colony of the empire. He relied not in vain upon God, but in the process he is called to endure great verbal abuse and great opposition. He outlived, however, all enmity. Through the merits of Jesus Christ, his only Redeemer and Savior, whom in his life and in his writings he had desired to glorify, he shall rise in the resurrection of the just. And this is his monument and gravesite in Westminster Cathedral, Westminster Abbey in London. The history of European morals suggests that the weary, the unwary, unostentatious, inglorious crusade of England against slavery may probably be regarded as one of the three or four most perfectly virtuous pages comprised in the history of nations. In other words, nations tend to have policies that are self-serving. This is some of the most unselfish and altruistic activities ever conducted by any nation, and on a grand scale. Performance, Wilberforce was convinced that Christianity must be allowed to pervade and penetrate every corner of a Christian's existence. He determined to put his faith into action in the political arena, and he persevered for 59 years to outlaw one of the most inhumane and profitable practices of his time. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. 2 Corinthians 3.17 Wilberforce and his friends were uniquely effective in altering the spirit of their age. John Venn commented on the Clapham community. Their lives spoke far more plainly and eloquently and convincingly than any words. We saw their patience, their cheerfulness, their generosity their wisdom and activity daily before us, and we knew and felt that all this was only the natural expression of hearts given to the service of God. As William himself often declared, it is not, in fact, in talents, in which we are chiefly wanting, but in resolute integrity. You could say that many of our people today have AIDS, 
acquired integrity deficiency syndrome. There's a deficiency of integrity today. The test for every question is, is it morally right? Wilberforce declared that the central test of any country was whether it believed in and practiced true Christianity. He declared one of the supreme political benefits of Christianity is its inherent, direct hostility to selfishness. There is no religion on the planet as hostile to selfishness as Christianity. As Jesus said, deny yourself. Forsake this world. Take up your cross. Follow me. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Lies bring bondage. Truth brings freedom. His biographer John Pollock observed, Wilberforce would disclaim the credit, but the essentials of his beliefs and of his conscience formed the foundation of the British character for the next two generations at least. He was proof that a man may change his times, although he cannot do it alone. Wilberforce had become the national conscience, and the effects of his actions on succeeding generations was extraordinary. The people of Britain may have hated him and hated what he said at the time, but later generations came to be grateful that he had done it. He pioneered a new political integrity in an age of corruption. He had transformed the House of Commons from a self-serving club to an assembly concerned for the common good of people worldwide. Unprecedented. Wilberforce had also developed new ways of arousing public opinion, such as through the pamphlet wars and petitions and graphic prints and local societies like Reformation societies and voters' guides. And he used it to influence Parliament and international policy of Britain. He also ensured that the British foreign policy would have its roots now in biblical principles of love for your neighbour. Most significant of all, William Wilberforce transformed his people's attitudes towards Africa and India. He planted in the public consciousness not merely a sensitivity against injustice, but a positive sense of obligation towards those people. Neighbours, even strangers. We are called to fulfil Christ's mandate to them. He inspired the idea of trusteeship, that was to influence British conduct overseas for at least another century. That, yes, we might rule other countries, but it's to serve. The abolition of slavery was one of the great turning points of history. If slavery had not been abolished before this great scramble for Africa, Africa would have been turned to a great slave farm, so enormous it would have corrupted and destroyed Europe itself. Just as surely as world conquest under conditions of slavery destroyed and corrupted the Roman Empire. Wilberforce's obedience to God, obedience to God's word in the Bible, was graciously used of God to bring freedom and life to millions. The abolition of the slave trade and the abolition of slavery removed a monumental obstacle for missionary outreaches in Africa. So long as slaving continued, it was very difficult for missionaries to even get into the interior of Africa let alone gather congregation amidst understandable suspicions of foreigners and the fear of being captured by slave-raiding tribes. Regularly, when Livingston met some tribes, they would be suspicious, but when they learned that he's English, they knew. English don't enslave people. The Portuguese do, but not the English, and he often received favour in people's eyes because of the fact that the English were known now to be the most hostile to slavery in the world. And so William Wilberforce and his co-workers helped prepare the way for the 19th century to become the greatest century for missionary advance. May God raise up a new generation of reformers in the tradition of William Wilberforce for the 21st century to proclaim liberty throughout the land. Leviticus 25.10. This presentation is a chapter of the Greatest Century of Missions book. And of course, you can access these articles on our Frontline Mission Essay.org website. And the audios and videos of presentations like these are uploaded. Even the presentation I've done now, we will upload on in both video form and as a PowerPoint and as a sermon audio. Are there any questions, any comments on Wilberforce and the war against slavery? Questions, comments? Yes. Thank you so much to someone for your presentation. And we thank God for the life of uh, uh, Wilson Fox for his dedication and his commitment uh, to fight against slavery. But uh, what I also would like to know is that um, the law, after that, we 
Yes. Good question. So, the eight great powers of Europe abolished the slave trade in 1815. The slave trade, not necessarily slavery, that took a further battle. So, the one power of Europe that would not sign the Treaty of 1815 was Portugal. So, Portugal continued to engage in slavery. And it, that was particularly emphasized by David Livingston, for example, that in Mozambique and Angola there was still slavery and things like this, which of course was not anywhere else in Africa at that stage, except for the Muslims. Now, Islam is based upon the Quran and upon the Hadith. The Quran is meant to be the words of Allah. The Hadith is, is the life and teachings of Muhammad. Muhammad owned slaves. Muhammad traded in slaves. Therefore, Islam cannot oppose slavery because the standard of righteousness in Islam is the life of Muhammad. So that's why Muslim countries don't have laws against abuse of women or uh, laws against, for example, marrying a child. Uh, what we would call statutory rape or pedophilia, child abuse, is accepted in a Muslim country because Muhammad had a six-year-old wife, Aisha. His third wife, Aisha, was six years old when he married her, nine years old when he consummated the marriage according to the Hadith. Therefore, Muslim countries can't condemn sleeping with or marrying little children because Muhammad practiced it. And similarly, they can't condemn slavery because slavery is practiced by Muhammad and slave trading. So that's why you get under Sharia law, they will not be hostile to these things because if Muhammad did it, it's good. If Muhammad didn't do it or he spoke against it, it's bad. And so Muhammad is their standard, not the Bible. And this is why Muslim countries might have been bullied and pressured by Britain to abolish the slave trade and so on, but they didn't ever really abolish it. They might have made laws to American companies, put pressure on Saudi Arabia to say that slavery is outlawed in 1962, but they're still doing it. And Mauritania in 1980, but they're still doing it. And so on. So, uh, and Britain persuaded the Turkish Empire to abolish the slave trade, but they still practiced it, actually. So, this is the problem. Islam cannot, with their whole heart, be enthusiastic against slavery or even child abuse. Because in the Hadith, they read that Muhammad did these things. And if Muhammad could have a six-year-old wife, how can I say that that is wrong? And if Muhammad could own slaves and sell slaves, how can I condemn slavery? So on the basis of the Quran and the Hadith, the Muslims are undermined in trying to oppose it. And I don't know of any prominent Muslim in history, or even today, who is a campaigner like Wilberforce was or Livingston against slavery or against child abuse, for example, in uh, underage sex with minors. Other comments, questions? Yes. I understand. Yeah, um, I understand what you're saying, and of course I agree with your sentiment, but you're actually wrong in quoting from Gamaliel. Gamaliel was not a believer. He never became a Christian, as we can see. What Gamaliel says, you see, there are things in the Bible that are recorded, 
That's not the same thing as being recommended. The Bible quotes from words of Judas. It quotes from words from Satan. So just because it's in the Bible recorded doesn't mean it's being recommended. The Bible records this comment that Gamaliel says, if this is of God, it will succeed. If it's not of God, it cannot succeed. But that's not true. Islam has managed to get 1.6 billion people in the world following it. It's just because it succeeded in gaining a great following doesn't make it right. Same with the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons or Catholicism. The fact that something succeeds is not proof that God's in it. And so just because Gamaliel said it and it's recorded in the Bible doesn't make it true. There are people who've been faithful, who did not succeed. We're called to be faithful. We may be blessed with success, but even if William Force had never been blessed with success, he did the right thing. And so success is in God's hands, but faithfulness, our duty, is ours. I have the duty to oppose evil, even if I'm never blessed with success. You may be a missionary called to Saudi Arabia and never win a convert that you know of. That doesn't mean it was wrong to go there. And someone else might be super successful, full stadiums. That doesn't necessarily mean it's of God. Just remember Islam, <laughs> Mormonism, Catholicism. Success in a worldly number sense does not necessarily mean God's blessings. Opposition from the world does not mean God's not in it. So Gamaliel's statement sometimes works out so, but it's not a biblical principle. Just because, for example, Jeremiah may seem to be a failure. Jeremiah did not persuade his country to repent. Jerusalem did get destroyed and the people were sent to exile. But Jeremiah could say he did the right thing in warning the people. The fact they didn't heed his warning didn't make Jeremiah a failure. Jeremiah was faithful, even though the people didn't believe and obey him. So um, I know your sentiment and I agree with you, but, but just be careful. It's uh, this thing of Gamaliel. Uh, his quote, a lot of people quote it, but it's actually not true. 